வணக்கம் இன் அவர் சீரீஸ் ஆன் த மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் ஃபிங்கர் மெட்டகாப்பல் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் வி நவ் கம் டு தி மெட்டகாப்பல் பேஸ் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் அண்ட் தீஸ் மெட்டகாப்பல் பேஸ் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் ஆர் யூஸ்வலி அசோசியேட்டட் வித் டிஸ்லொகேஷன் ஆஃப் த கார்போ மெட்டகாப்பல் ஜாயின்ஸ் ஆஃப் த ஃபிங்கர்ஸ் and perhaps these are the most dramatic of the metacarpal fractures because all the metacarpals might be dislocated either to the volar side the dorsal side ulnar side or radial side or a single carpal metacarpal joint may be dislocated along with the fracture of the base the management is quite simple or quite complicated depending on the clinical situation that makes it all the more interesting let us see how these metacarpal base fractures with associated carpal metacarpal joint dislocations are managed finger metacarpal base fractures are usually associated with avulsion fractures or dislocation of carpal metacarpal joints of the fingers they can involve the second and third metacarpal bases the fourth metacarpal base the fifth metacarpal base or all the finger metacarpal bases in different combinations to understand about these base fractures we need to understand the anatomy of the metacarpal base and the carpal metacarpal joints the second carpal metacarpal joint consists of the index finger metacarpal that is the second metacarpal articulating primarily with the trapezoid and secondarily with the trapezium and the capitate the third carpal metacarpal joint has the articulation between the middle finger metacarpal or the third metacarpal articulating with the distal surface of only the capitate The fourth carpal metacarpal joint has the ring finger metacarpal the fourth metacarpal articulating with the distal surfaces of both the capitate and the hamate and finally the fifth carpal metacarpal joint is formed by the little finger metacarpal or the fifth metacarpal articulating with the distal surface of the hamate whenever we consider a joint we need to consider two things the stability and the mobility of the joints first let us consider how the stability of these carpal metacarpal joints of the fingers is brought about these joints are saddle joints and they are stabilized by volar and dorsal ligaments transverse metacarpal ligaments between the bases of the metacarpals long flexor and extensor tendons and the intrinsic muscles of the hand which are attached close by so looking at the forces stabilizing the carpal metacarpal joints of the fingers we would note that the second to fifth carpal metacarpal joints are inherently stable and an excessive axial load like a road accident or punching a solid wall or a blast injury is required to disrupt the cmc joints anatomy that may be true but we need to realize that the movements are different in different carpal metacarpal joints of the fingers the second and third carpal metacarpal joints have limited antero posterior gliding or translatory movements these are very minimal movements the fourth carpal metacarpal joint has a little amount of flexion and extension also but it is the fifth carpal metacarpal joint that is the joint of the little finger that has flexion and extension and also internal and external rotation basically the stability of a joint is inversely proportional to the mobility the more mobile the joint the less stable it is so by our understanding the second and third carpal metacarpal joints are relatively stable because they have less mobility and the fourth and fifth carpal metacarpal joints are less stable because they have more mobility when we look at the epidemiology of injuries to the metacarpal base and the carpal metacarpal joints of the fingers we note that the fourth and fifth carpal metacarpal joints are involved in 27% isolated dislocation of the fourth carpal metacarpal joint in 18% dislocation of the second carpal metacarpal joint in 9% and triple carpal metacarpal joint dislocations in 18% the clinical features of such injuries are often non specific of course 
following a history of trauma. There is edema, dorsal deformation, limited range of motion or finger misalignment in severe cases. An x-ray would reveal the fracture of the base of the metacarpal with the dislocation of the corresponding carpometacarpal joint or joints. In such injuries, there are four points to be noted. The number and position of the involved metacarpals, usually the fifth and fourth metacarpal bases with their corresponding carpometacarpal joints, whether it is a simple fracture or dislocation or a fractured dislocation of the metacarpal, the commonest being a fractured dislocation, the direction of dislocation of the metacarpal, usually dorsally, an additional fracture of the distal carpal road, usually involving the hamate bone. An X-ray is the commonest investigation to find these features, but sometimes it may be difficult to interpret due to overlapping of structures. So we need to take good anteroposterior views, true lateral view and oblique views. And identification of gillulas lines will help in diagnosing injuries to the carpal bones. Treatment of basal metacarpal fractures, especially with carpometacarpal joint dislocations, is very important. The problems of inadequate treatment are weakness of grip, stiffness of joints and persistent pain. The dilemma we have when faced with the prospect of treating such injuries is whether we can do a closed reduction and POP immobilization or whether we need to do a closed reduction and percutaneous pinning or whether both of these would not work and we need to do an open reduction and fixation. A study states that there is no clear consensus over the management of acute carpometacarpal joint fractured dislocations as both conservative and operative methods have been shown to produce good results. And another study states that most authors agree that delayed cases should be treated with open reduction and internal fixation in order to restore anatomy, prevent secondary dislocation and achieve full functional grip. The indications for conservative management that is either reduction of the fracture dislocation and POP immobilization or reduction of the fracture and percutaneous fixation are acute closed injuries presenting early or comminuted fracture dislocations. The indications for open reduction and fixation are open injuries, fracture dislocations that are unstable after reduction, delayed presentation that is more than 48 hours or avulsion fracture dislocations of the second and third metacarpals or even fracture dislocations of the fourth and fifth carpometacarpal joints with dorsal or coronal shear hamate fractures. Let us now consider the features and management of the basic patterns of injuries involving metacarpal base fractures and carpometacarpal joint dislocations. We shall be considering the fractures of the base of the second and third metacarpals with dislocations, the fracture of the base of the fourth metacarpal, the fifth metacarpal base fractures and multiple metacarpal base fracture dislocations and finally, we shall look at blast injuries causing fractures of the metacarpal base with carpometacarpal joint dislocations. As we have already seen, fracture dislocations of the second and third metacarpal bases are quite rare because of the lack of motion in these joints. They usually result from fall on a flexed wrist. If the dislocation is dorsal, it could be due to the pull of the extensor carpi radialis longus and the extensor carpi radialis brevis which are inserted into the bases of the second and third metacarpals respectively. These fracture dislocations can be managed operatively or non-operatively, but to get back good function, operative management is ideal. This example shows a volar dislocation of the second metacarpal base. Here again, the pull of the flexor carpi radialis on the volar side should be negated, hence a percutaneous fixation after reduction is ideal. Isolated ring finger metacarpal fractures should raise the possibility of an associated carpometacarpal joint injury. If they are not very obvious, we need to take additional X-ray views or in some cases even a CT scan. 
even an innocuous and innocent looking fracture like this should be investigated further to rule out dislocations. Fractures of the fifth metacarpal base are usually associated with dislocations which have proximal and dorsal subluxation of the metacarpal. This particular injury results from a longitudinally directed force along the fifth metacarpal and the displacement that occurs subsequently is accentuated by the pull of the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon insertion into the base of the fifth metacarpal. This fracture dislocation may also be associated with the subluxation of the fourth metacarpal base or a fracture of the hamate which is usually a coronal shear fracture. Additional views on x-ray to get a better visualization of the fracture dislocation would be an anteroposterior view with forearm pronated 30 degrees from fully supinated position and a 30 degree pronated lateral view and of course a CT scan would be very helpful. In this example of fracture dislocation of the fifth metacarpal base, treatment has been done with reduction and percutaneous pinning with individual pins to the intact fourth metacarpal, to the fragment of the fifth metacarpal base and to the hamate for proximal stability. When there is an associated fracture of the hamate, the percutaneous pinning of the fifth metacarpal to the fourth metacarpal could be combined with screw fixation of the fractured hamate. The technique of reduction of the fifth metacarpal base fracture dislocation is as follows. Under appropriate anesthesia, longitudinal traction is applied and a pressure is applied on the dorsum towards the palmar side on the base of the fifth metacarpal to reduce it. This procedure must be done under image intensification and after reduction, the fifth metacarpal shaft is pinned into the intact fourth metacarpal and a second pin is driven obliquely directed across the fifth metacarpal hamate joint. We have already seen an example showing this fixation. If it is only a dislocation of the carpometacarpal joint of the little finger, it needs percutaneous pinning only to the intact fourth metacarpal and to the hamate. If this technique is not stable or is not possible, open reduction internal fixation needs to be done. A dorsal ulnar incision is used to visualize the joint and care must be taken to protect the dorsal sensory branches of the ulnar nerve. The joint is debrided of loose fracture fragments, the articular surface is reduced and reduction is maintained with multiple K wires or small screws. Now we come to the entity of multiple carpometacarpal joint dislocations. These usually result from high energy injuries that nearly always require open reduction and internal fixation. A trial closed reduction can be done, but if it is unsuccessful due to re-dislocation or subluxation, open reduction is necessary. After reduction, pinning with K wires is recommended. When multiple joints are involved, the dislocation can be either volar as you can see in this x-ray or dorsal as in this example. When all the carpometacarpal joints have been dislocated, it is very difficult to understand how to get a good reduction and alignment of all the joints. It is easy to remember here one important point. The third metacarpocapitate articulation creates a so-called keystone position. So reduction and stabilization of the third carpometacarpal joint is fundamental for reduction of the remaining carpometacarpal joints. For a patient presenting with acute closed dislocations of the carpometacarpal joints, conservative management with reduction and POP immobilization may be enough if they are stable after reduction. But most of the times closed reduction and percutaneous pinning or open reduction and internal fixation is indicated. If a patient presents late, that is more than 48 hours after the injury, edema sets in and this does not allow an easy reduction of the dislocations. Hence, delayed presentations warrant open reduction and internal fixation. For open reduction, 
a dorsal longitudinal incision is preferred and reduction is usually simple and can be maintained with K wires extending from the metacarpals into the carpus. In this example, you will note a fracture of the bases of all the four finger metacarpals with volar dislocations. The skin lacerations were both on the dorsum and on the palmar aspect on the radial border and the finger web between the index and mid fingers. By utilizing the dorsal laceration with extension of the wound, the carpometacarpal joints were reduced and the fixation was done on the second, third and fifth metacarpals with K wires extending proximally into the carpus. The ultimate result was stable carpometacarpal joints of the fingers allowing a good healing of the wounds and good active range of motion of the fingers. Finally, we come to blast injuries which are a very common cause of multiple metacarpal base fractures with carpometacarpal joint dislocations. They are usually open injuries and have a burn element associated. There is always a loss of soft tissues with or without amputations of the fingers and characteristic features of fracture dislocations of the carpometacarpal joints. Let us consider these characteristic features with the number or the involvement of the metacarpal basis, the association with dislocation, the direction of dislocation and the association with other bony injuries. It could involve the basis of all the finger metacarpals along with dislocations of the four carpometacarpal joints. Sometimes there could be only a partial involvement as in this example where only the basis of the second and third metacarpals are fractured or in this example where only the third and fourth carpometacarpal joint dislocations have occurred. This warranted an open reduction and fixation with K wires. The association of other fractures like the carpal bones are very common in such kind of high energy blast injuries. As in any hand injury, therapy forms an important part of the treatment protocol. If therapy is not adequate, stiffness of the wrist in flexion and metacarpophalangeal joints in extension can occur, weakness of flexion of the fingers can occur and decreased power grip due to the weakness of the intrinsic muscles can occur. An adequate therapy would consist of stabilizing the wrist with a splint before starting mobilization of the metacarpophalangeal joints and the interphalangeal joints along with regular scar massage to prevent adhesion of the tendons. Let us study a particular case to understand the involvement of the basic principles of hand surgery and therapy in the treatment of metacarpal base fractures with carpometacarpal joint dislocations. This young man presented three days after injury in a road traffic accident with a brawny swelling on the palm and dorsum of the left hand. X-ray revealed a volar dislocation of all the carpometacarpal joints of the fingers. Considering the acute compartment syndrome that was occurring in the palm, a decompression was done extending into the forearm. 48 hours post decompression, an open reduction and internal fixation was done using a dorsal approach. The decompression wound was closed secondarily. Fixation of the second, third and fourth metacarpals into the carpus appeared satisfactory. The K wires, the K wires were removed at 3 weeks a wrist stabilization splint was applied and therapy was started. This was the range of movement seen at one month post-op. After another month, that is at two months post-op, this was the range of movements observed. And at five months post-op, almost a full range of flexion and extension was achieved. The healing of the bones was also satisfactory. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about the basics of metacarpal neck fracture management and the basics of metacarpal head fracture management. And do not forget to subscribe 
to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, trauma surgery and ethics. Manakkam.